Take the roll. Deputy Mayor Van Ness. Here. Councilmember Sperry. Here. Councilmember Danuski. Here. Councilmember Curtis. Present. Councilmember Herbig. Here. Mayor Baker. Here. Councilmember Smith. Here. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda, but I understand there's a modification to the agenda. Cool. City Manager, you want an executive session after the council meeting before the Transportation Benefit District. Okay, so the, there is a... Uh, I have order. The Transportation yeah, Benefit District echo. isn't on the agenda either. That's because it's its own That's agenda after we close the council meeting. meeting. Okay. Oh, that okay. wasn't on Civic Web either. Um, I'm, I'm not... Patty? Huh. Transportation Benefit District was I'll let it rest for a moment. published where? It was published in the Transportation Benefit District folder on Right, but then where was the notification given? It was sent out the same way. Okay. Okay. Fine. Um, all right. So uh, Thank you. Yeah. unless there are objections, the agenda will stand approved as modified with an exec session following the council meeting before the Transportation Benefit District meeting. And if there's no objections, uh, the agenda will stand approved as modified. The next item on the agenda is um, a proclamation. Um, and let me get to the proclamation. Uh, for uh, kids to uh, park today, uh, whereas Saturday, May 21st, 2016, is the sixth Kids to Parks Day organized and launched by the National Park Trust. And whereas Kids to Parks Day empowers kids and encourages families to get outdoors and visit America's parks. And whereas it's important to introduce a new generation to our nation's parks because of the decline in park attendance over the last decades. And whereas we should encourage children to lead a more active lifestyle, to combat the issues of childhood obesity, diabetes, mellitus, hypertension, and hypercholesteremia. And whereas Kids to Parks Day is open to all children and adults across the country to encourage a large and diverse group of participants. And whereas Kids to, Day Parks, uh, Kids to Parks Day will broaden children's appreciation for nature and the outdoors. And whereas the city of Kenmore has been recognized by the national nonprofit organization Kaboom as a playful city community and is active in the Let's Move Cities, Towns, and Counties programs. And whereas the city of Kenmore features spectacular local and state parks and the Burke Gilman Trail, including waterfront activity center at Squires Landing Park. Now, therefore, I, David Baker, Mayor of City of the Kenmore, Washington, on behalf of the City Council, am pleased to proclaim May 21st, 2016, to be Kids to Parks Day in the City of Kenmore, and we encourage all residents of the city to make time on May 21st to take children in their lives to a neighborhood, state, or national park. Next item on the agenda, then, is citizen comments. This is an opportunity for you to express your views on issues that are important to you and to the community. We ask that you please limit your comments to three minutes. And you have a green light on that uh, device up on the speaker's podium. When you have 30 seconds left, it goes yellow. And when the light becomes red, um, we ask you to please wrap up and uh, be respectful of others. And, and uh, and your comments. Clerk, please call the first person. Elizabeth Mooney. Hi, Elizabeth Mooney, 5934 Northeast 201st Street, Kenmore. I'm here tonight to say thank you, City of Kenmore Council and staff, for telling the Kiwit General Manson folks that they cannot come here to Kenmore to demolish the old 520 floating bridge. Please continue to stand firm and know that the citizens are behind you. Please stand firm despite Kenmore, Kiwit General Manson suing the city of Kenmore. We are proud that you have stood up to KGM. Let them find an alternative location to take the demolition 
of the old 520 floating bridge. Don't give in. Our public health and safety is priceless. The demolition may have hidden costs. Let somebody else take that. Thank you, Mrs. Mooney. Bob Green. Uh, Bob Green, uh, 6250 Northeast 182nd Street, Kenmore. And I want to echo what Elizabeth said. Uh, I've got uh, Rob's letter here uh, addressed to Kiewit General Manson. And um, we, we live above the Air Harbor there, and when they were constructing a bridge, uh, that was a six-day-a-week operation. Uh, it, uh, they started at like 4 a.m. in the morning. I went down one day to talk to them. I said, you know, why are you running this on Saturday? And they said that our, our concrete cycle requires that. So we had backup beepers going up at 3 a.m. in the morning, 4 a.m. in the morning on that construction site. It was a, a, a genuine impact to our community. And I, I realize this uh, puts the city at risk for a lot of uh, incurred expense on legal fees and the rest. And um, I'm hoping that, I, that you'll keep us informed of, of uh, what your struggles there with Peter Kewitt. And, and, uh, and, and then as a member of the community, I want to back you up on that. And I want to rally this community to, to stand with you on that. Because I think it's what's right for our community. And I uh, appreciate it very much. And that one other thing I'd like to mention is I'm very impressed with the way the construction has been executed on the west end of 522, the completion to 68. It's really moved along, and it looks really great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. Janet Hayes. Hi. Janet Hayes at 6303 Northeast 181st, number 301, Kenmore. And I want to thank you very much for your standing up to KGM. I'm saying the same things that they are, but it is huge to our community. The fear in this community is a toxic shoreline forever. Um, what is driving that fear is the avoidance of conversation when talking about uh, the demo that's coming and what we want and what we don't want. Um, what the community is saying and, and concerned about is the fact that when they hear it on the news, um, they hear about the dust and the noise. Yes, that's a concern, the dust, but is much more than dust. It is toxic because it is contaminated. So I think it would be helpful, even for your case, to talk about the toxic dust and contamination it can create, not just that we're going to be breathing dust. We breathe dust every day. Um, this is. This is something that's planned, and we know it's there. Um, so that, that might be something that you think about when you talk about it to the media. I know I'm going to. And um, we, don't, uh, the, we don't want the dust either. OK, that what I've already said. <laughs> the noise is another thing, and as uh, Robert talked about, we live with that every day, and it's hard to get up and make a phone call, and then there's no one to make the phone call to, and you hear them working over there. That not only occurs on the land, but when they're driving the tugboats in, we hear the hug tugboats and see the lights, and one of the issues when Kiwit was there for the three and a half, four years that they were there, they would bring instead of, they knew I was the person that took pictures, they knew where I lived. They started coming in at night and in the early morning in the dark and, there, and, and they gave information to the King County Council, Larry Phillips, that they were policing themselves at that time and looking in the water and seeing if they were stirring up the sediment. We know we've got dioxins. We know they're in the sediment, 
and we want you to know that the community is behind you. And just ask us. Ask us to do anything. Ask us to march. Ask us. I mean, we're there for you to, to fight for you. And if there's anything we can look up, and as I told Rod Kasaguma, if there's anything I can provide, I have thousands of pictures that might make a big difference on saying, hey, they can't come in this, and it's nobody's fault but people from 50 years ago. They cannot do it. And, and you've got resources that you need to tap, it, and it's the people in your community. I've worked for eight years, and you'll, I've got some ammo, and I'm willing to share it. So thank you very much. And, and it's, it's real nice if you allay some of our fears by just letting us know what's happening and what's next. I know there's a lot of conf confidentiality, and that's that. But thank let you, us Mr. know when you can. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Thank you. Patrick O'Brien. Patrick O'Brien, 6330 Northeast 181st Street, Kenmore. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to see a backup camera for meetings where the computer goes out because I think it's important that in this litigation that you're going through with Kiwit that, that you have some sort of ability to communicate with the public that there were people here supporting your decision to not allow the demolition of the 520 bridge and if that you know for the investment of a $350 camera you could have that so that's one thing so what is this all about um, this is not just a case of permitting uh, terminology disorder there are other things that you could have said uh, are lacking in the key wits total process of applying for a permit. So first let's look at some of the problems. We had a lack of enforcement on issues. We certainly had lack of, of, of health issues as part of the permitting process. So those could range from noise, hours of operation, all the things that other people have already testified to, and those weren't really questions asked in the permitting process that I saw, especially this latest one where I did see the, uh, the permit that they, they filled out. So lack of due diligence for the applied for new land use permit. What were the time frames when they entered into those discussions with the city? Who knew about their desire to demolish the bridge and when? State economics will state that if they don't demolish that bridge here, and it is found to have the contamination that we believe it does, that's $280 per ton of disposal fee. Because if it's found to have asbestos in it, which we believe it is, they're going to have to put that in a sealed landfill. $280 a ton is a lot of money, and that might be why the state's not interested in doing this another way. So we have to be cognizant of, of that amount of money and fight like crazy because they're going to try to save that money. So uh, where should this bridge rightfully be taken apart? Well, it should be in an enclosed building somewhere where you have monitoring, filtration, and a bag house, and you're not leaching those materials into any surface water. We don't have that here. So it is inappropriate from a health aspect to do that demolition here. Um, that's, it's got to go in a sealed landfill. Uh, then we also have the issue of jackhammers. If you take something apart in a demolition, they have big, they have, did you see all the track hose they have? They have a little, little fleet of track hose, and they're all going to have that, that hydraulic ram for breaking up concrete. They're lined up there. It looks like a Toyota uh, dealership. I mean, they're, they're ready to make some noise. Um, so what did Kiwit get? When they brought the construction here, they saved $40 million. Remember that? They, they were able to bid high $40 million because this site was chosen in its proximity to where the bid was made, so where the bridge was made. So they have some, some money that they got because you were nice to them and you allowed them to do that construction here. $40 million they profited in. 
just right off the bat. So is Gary Sargent suing you? I'm not sure about who all the people are that are trying to sue you, but I would just take a look at that and see what people you've tried to help over the years. And I think you've helped Gary Sargent quite a bit. So if he's now suing you, what does that say about anything? Okay, WashDOT is not wanting to be a litigant because it's not pretty to have one government agency sue a city. So, so they're going to let Kiwit uh, try to force, force their, their way uh, onto that site again. And then we have the old site, uh, the, an old case, Waterfront Construction, was off the case, off that property for some... wrap up, please, th Mr. There's, there's no indication. Oh, they're over there. All right, I'm, I have it some more time. It's still it, blinking. It, it, uh, well, when so it's blinking red, waterfront it means it's construction. Up. Waterfront construction was a case that was heard and won. Waterfront construction had to leave, and that that property was then vacated for more than three years. It didn't have anything on it except for two wetlands. So go back and look at that when it's time to fight. And then there's some a letter I pointed out, and there's so some. Brian, if I please get you to wrap up. It, certainly, uh, there's the Pioneer towing case. Uh, there's their, uh, their, their misstatements in total uh, disturbed area. They say zero acres for this latest permit. There's several uh, omissions and incorrect statements in their permit. So I would go back to them and say, you know, you, you, didn't, you didn't supply us with a valid permit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you all for your comments tonight. Um, next item on our agenda is uh, the consent agenda. Is there a, uh, a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Um, any further discussion? Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Consent agenda stands approved. Excuse me, Mayor Baker, I, I missed the moved what, and seconded. Pardon? I missed who moved and seconded. Uh, Brent Smith moved, Alan Van Ness, Deputy Mayor, seconded. Thank you. Patty, you're, you're, you're slipping up. Uh, I forgot. Flag <laughs> salute. If I can get you all to please stand. <laughs> Between the internet going down and everything else, hey, Your Honor, not being able to read sometimes in your minds. Uh, just one clarification: uh, my understanding is that the the camera is working and live streaming. Oh, yeah. okay. It's it's Wi-Fi that we're having. Wi-Fi that's down. Oh great! Thank you. Um, all right. Next item on the agenda is business agenda. Uh, discussion on issues for the 2016 Housing Strategy Plan and direction of the Planning Commission. Ms. Vint and Ms. Anderson and Mr. Sullivan. Good evening, Council. We do have a PowerPoint presentation this evening uh, if you want to raise your screens. So um, with me, this evening is uh, Laurie Anderson, Senior Planner, and Arthur Sullivan with Arch, and also Mike Stanger is in the back there with Arch as well. So why are we here this evening? Well, when you uh, did the latest update to the comprehensive plan, um, an implementation measure of the housing element was developing a housing strategy plan. And this year you put that item on the docket. Um, for the Planning Commission. When you had your retreat in January, you were very interested in talking about an affordable housing strategy and had many questions, and in fact, you wanted to have a meeting and uh, discuss the topic before you gave direction to the Planning Commission. So that's the purpose of the evening tonight. Uh, Mr. Sullivan will give a PowerPoint presentation and walk through some information with respect to housing affordability. And when, before we leave this evening, uh, we would like your direction 
um, to the Planning Commission so that the Planning Commission has a framework to work with and addresses the topics that you wish them to discuss. There are there is a possibility of including other elements in the housing strategy, and that was one of the attachments in your packet. But we would um, strongly recommend that you really focus on housing affordability and be sort of strategic in taking a look at that this year and maybe holding off on some of those other elements for a future year. Um, did I, Laurie, did I miss anything? I don't think so. So I, I've run out of things to say, actually, until the, <laughs> until the PowerPoint's ready to go. Um, but I guess while we have some uh, technical... Not on the network, you've got it on a thumb drive, everything's fine. <laughs> it, should, it should be. It's all uploaded there. What Laurie is doing, she's handing out um, an updated piece of information um, for you this evening, which uh, Mr. Sullivan will, will be going over. So. I think we're ready to go off. Are you okay? Um, they see this. They see this on the screens in front of on them. On your screen. Yes. Yeah. So, so they can see it. And the okay. And we do have a member of the public here can see it, and it also be um, live streamed as well. So Arthur, take it away. Okay. So uh, what we wanted to do tonight is sort of um, use the attachment two to be. Um, use attachment two to sort of help you walk through the conversation that you um, wanted to have and hopefully we provided you some information to give you that context for doing so. Um, we thought first it would be helpful to do a little revisit of housing needs um, from the city point of view and then we wanted to talk to you about different kinds of strategies and see if that helps uh, provide some direction for you to give to the commission and staff in order to work forward um, with the, um, with the strategy plan. Um, this slide here just sort of highlights the language in your housing element uh, in the implementation strategy section about adopting a housing strategy plan. So this is the policy background for why, you, uh, why this is in front of you. Um, so just sort of going there. In terms of housing needs, um, we provided in the packet two kind of levels of information. Uh, one is some very general information about income and housing affordability. And then second, we gave, we also thought it might be helpful, and, and the information that you see in here, a lot of this is already in your comprehensive plan and the housing needs analysis that we did last year um, when you were doing your housing element. We just tried to pull out what we thought were some of the really high level uh, pieces of information. But then we also thought it might help Full to sort of look what we're describing is focused housing needs, which is sort of translating some of the data into more sort of, well, what are the kind of needs related to types of households that then might give some context for thinking about housing strategies. So we wanted to sort of go through a few of those and get your reaction to them and your thoughts and, um, and your thoughts about them. Um, the first is, and as was mentioned, we handed out, because in your um, attachment, we had income levels at like 60, 70, and 80% of median income, probably because we were doing some work for another city recently and those were levels they needed. The handout we gave you is showing you income and rents and affordable prices for 30, 50, and 80% of median as well as median income. Um, the median income right now for a family of four in King County is just over $90,000. That's the most current 2016 figure. And all of the figures in terms of affordability tie back to that number. Um, and we're doing sort of two different things in this chart here. Is one is, or in your handout, is we're showing you what incomes are at 30, 50, and 80 because those are the thresholds that we use for talking about housing affordability uh, under the countywide planning policies and your housing element. And then we also show you what that translates to rents. And so I think it's important to have a context. So even at 30% of median income, you can see from your handout, that still means an income of 19,000 or just under 19,000 a year for a single person, up to $27,000 for a year for a family of four. That still translates to oh, $10 an hour or more or higher than the minimum wage. So people who are working gainfully full time can potentially still be very low income, which we'll come back and revisit. Low income is from 30 to $45,000 a year. So 
Um, these are adjustments we make because as a whole, smaller households, um, they don't often have as much income. So these are adjustments that we use uh, for showing that. And at that low income level, that means an affordability level of $790 to $1,100 a month. In the attachment that we gave you, we're showing you what average rents are in Kenmore. So you can sort of equate the income levels in this chart to what people can find in your community in terms of average rents. We also have some information on local salaries, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so this chart is hopefully there just for you to have as a reference when we're talking about needs, but um, I prefer talking about it in terms of salaries and real incomes because that's what most people think about. They don't think about what percent of median income they are. So the two really basic pieces of information we provided you in the uh, memo is that first, how much housing does your community have relative to what we consider to be countywide needs? And so um, by each of those different income levels, up to 30 percent, between 30 and 50, 80 percent, and then median income. And the yellow bars, so that shows you that somewhere around 12 percent of all households are at 30 percent of median or less in the county. Um, and about Another 12, just under 12 percent, have incomes between 30 and 50. So over 20 percent of all households have incomes that are lower income. What the yellow bar shows is how does the affordability of our housing look when we look at it countywide? And then the light brown tan bar is showing you the amount of affordable units or how much of your housing is affordable at each of those income levels. And as you can see, as with most cities in the county, um, the greatest need or where we're having the biggest challenge is in the zero to 30, but there's still challenges in the 30 and 50 percent um, level income. And even in the 50 to 80, even though the bars show a matchup, if you're at 55 percent of median income, you're still probably struggling because uh, the rents are probably more closer to 70 and 80 percent of median that you see in that. Or if you're a first time home buyer, a lot of that housing isn't ownership housing per se. So if you're trying to become a homeowner, um, I've been studying this issue for a long time. Typically, first time home buyers, when you start to get to be around 70, 80 percent of median income, when we've had healthy housing markets, you can start thinking about it. Um, that's sort of been our in healthy housing markets. That's what we typically see. So this chart just sort of shows sort of that disparity. And you and the other members of ARCH have very similar patterns in terms of your housing. You're a little bit you're a little bit better in terms of overall affordability for sure, but you still see that same general pattern we see for a lot of the cities that we work with um, in East King County and other parts of the county as well. The other sort of really big what we consider what's it really boiled down to is. What are people at different income levels, how much of their income are they paying for housing? So this chart is trying to show you that uh, we're showing you that if you're earning under 30 percent of median income, just over 70 percent of those households are what we refer to as severely cost burden. That means they're paying over 50 percent of their income for housing. The standard for being cost burden is 30 percent of your income for housing. If you're paying more for th than 30 percent of your income, you are probably challenged with meeting your other living expenses. Um, and even more so if you're lower income because it's a percentage of a smaller number. Um, but insurance is the same and a lot of other food expenses can be, you know, that you have to pay can be very similar. So what this chart shows, again, you're experiencing what most other jurisdictions are seeing, which is if you're under 50 percent of median income, there's a very good chance that you are cost burden or very uh, severely cost burden. And that percentage goes down, especially once you get above median income, where you can see those figures um, go down uh, significantly. What I would also point out is that when we did your needs analysis, your jurisdiction had one of the largest increases of overall population that's cost burden and severely cost burden of the cities in East King County and in, in compared to the countywide average. We all saw the percentages going up from 2000 to 2010. Your proportion of your population that is severely cost burden went up more than most other jurisdictions um, that we look at. So that's one other. Look, I have a question. Just a little clarification again on the numbers, please. Yes. So 669 households? Yes. Which is 70% of the population at 30%, below 30%? You got it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So again, this is sort of big picture, but that doesn't, 
that sort of tells you what needs are, but what we thought might be helpful for this conversation is to think about needs from a more household point of view. And so in the memo, we identified uh, several different, um, what we considered to be kind of focused housing needs is how we sort of refer to them. The first is the demand for housing from your workforce. So what does your workforce look like? That's where we see a lot of our housing demand come from, is from our workforce. And what this slide is showing you is that when we look at the workforce in Kenmore, what we did is we saw how many, what percentage of your workforce is earning at different income levels. And so we have up to 25,000, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, and above 75,000. And what th this shows is that for the workforce in Kenmore, you have a relatively high proportion of your workforce is earning, almost 40% is earning $25,000 a year. Um, this includes all types of jobs, so it can be part-time and full-time, but for your different, um, in your local workforce. And then on the rest of the way, you can see you have a roughly the same proportion as countywide averages in the next two levels. And then in the over 75,000, you have a lower proportion of your workforce in that. Um, you have a lot of employees in the service sector and also in the retail sector, um, which is probably what's contributing to this. But that just sort of shows you relative um, to your workforce what their salaries are. Yours story is a little bit different than the other members of ARCH. When the other members of ARCH, it's the size of the workforce, um, which is a lot of the issue. Relative to your housing supply, you don't have as large a workforce compared to your, um, how much housing you have available, but the workforce you do have is skewed more towards these, um, these sal lower salary ranges. Yes, Deputy. By workforce, do you mean people living in Kenmore who are working or no. working in Kenmore? Working in Kenmore. So this is reflective of your workforce. Correct, correct. This is looking at the, what we'd like to look at is what is the demand being generated for housing in our communities in East King County. So this is looking at your employees, okay? So this was one area of focus need that we identify. A second area is thinking about seniors. And when we think about seniors and we sort of look at the data, there seem to be three issues related to housing needs that seem to pop up related to seniors. The first is seniors who want to be able to stay in their home, either through physical needs or, or costs of maintaining their houses or et cetera. That seems to be one distinct kind of need. A second distinct need is for those who are renters, can they afford their rent and the affordability of rental housing? And then the third is for people who have special physical needs that for whatever reason they need, um, you know, they may have mobility issues or site issues, but they may need something beyond just a standard house, may need to have the house adapted or be in housing with services because they need support in order to be able to live wherever they're, where they're living at the time. Um, we have sections in your memo that go into a variety of different data. We just highlighted on the slide a couple of the points that we called out in your memo, um, basically saying that of senior renters, over half are cost burden or severely cost burden, and essentially all of them, with most of them cost burden, severely cost burden, and they're all lower income um, that we saw that are, that are cost burden or severely cost burden. Then we also saw, we noted that not necessarily just a senior issue, but Persons who have special housing needs, there's sort of an overlap in you know, seniors or other persons in the community who have special needs where they may need services. You have about 400 households in your community that receive SSI, which means you need to have a low income as well as some form of disability um, to receive that assistance. And that can be either, a, you don't have to be a senior in order to receive that. Um, so that gives some context there. The third area that we looked at were young adults. Um, and about 18% of your population are young adults age 20 to 35. Um, generally, younger adults, and your proportion of young adults is pretty similar to countywide, is that they're often renters. And as renters, they have a tendency to have a higher proportion who are rent cost burden or severely cost burden. Um, and your data proves that out to be similar to other parts of the, of other parts of the region and county. The other next area that we identified were people who wanted to be first-time buyers or young families, people who are ready to move on to ownership, um, can be singles or others, but, um, but we sort of grouped these two together. 
And again, as I said earlier, in healthy housing markets, usually when you get to about 70% of median, you should be hopefully getting to a point you can save up, you can do that, and if you want to become an owner, there's often opportunities. We find in your community that only about 7% of your housing, that ownership housing, is affordable at moderate incomes, and only 16% affordable at median income. So it's a relatively, compared to other, the countywide averages, it's a relatively low percentage of your housing that's affordable. Um, and then the other trend that you're experiencing, just like other areas of our county, incomes are not keeping up with the price increases of ownership housing in the last few years. And then finally, um, I think something that was raised in earlier conversations, we gave you some data on manufactured housing. Um, you have six communities uh, that what's interesting is those are characterized as home ownership housing. And looking at the statistics, it almost looks like 40% of the ownership housing that you have that is affordable to modern income are probably is about are in the manufactured housing community. So they have formed, um, they have served a very unique kind of need in your community. And what we have seen is the variety, there is a study done by the assessor where they rank the quality of homes or the condition of homes, and you have a wide range of conditions of your manufactured housing in your community. And it's not necessarily one park versus another, it's, just, it's throughout the various um, manufactured housing communities in your, in your town. Uh, and then the last category that we kind of called out, this is an issue that's gotten a lot of attention in the last uh, 10 years, um, but seems to be an area of growing need is homelessness and to sort of bring in to sort of the local level, the North Shore School District has over 220 homeless students in their school district last year, and, or maybe two years ago, and the one night count saw the count in East King County um, increase last year, and so we're still seeing that homelessness does exist outside the main city, and we're seeing that the growth that we hear about is occurring throughout the county and not just in certain areas of the county. So, these are ways we tried to take some of the data from that big report and sort of hone it in on types of households and kinds of people that sort of help translate to maybe looking at housing strategies that might focus on these different needs. So at this point, we wanted your reaction to that information. Um, do these seem to reflect? Do you have questions about any of the information that was in here or in the presentation? Um, is one question, and then we have some questions about does this help give some context for talking about housing needs? Deputy Mayor. Can you go back to the previous slide? Please? Sure. I have a question about the homeless. Uh, yes. The statements under that don't apply to Anwar, the North Shore School District. Correct. And uh, East King County, which is a million people. Right. Uh, what's the percentage or how many of those are actually in Anwar? I don't, let's see, I have a chart here, I tried to bring back up. The other, the other categories you were, you were zooming in on, what like can more. Right. And this is because with homeless, it's harder to hone in on individual cities. Um, when they do the count, they don't necessarily do every area. They've picked certain physical geographic areas and they go back to the same areas. And if I can find it, oh, I don't, I only have the east side as a whole. But they look at a few places in Bellevue, certain neighborhoods. They look in Woodenville. Um, so they look at certain neighborhoods, and they don't cover the whole east side. This is the actual outdoor count. There's another component of the count, which hasn't been published yet, which looks at those who are homeless but sheltered. So if they are in a shelter, that will be a separate number. So this is not counting for all the people in transitional housing or in the Ken like the Kenmore shelter that Hope Link operates. This is people that they find from walking around on streets who are in um, cars and or outdoors. Um, and like I said, they don't cover every city individually, so we look at it more as subregions um, for the one night count. And I'm not sure a neighborhood in Kenmore is included. I, I'd have to go back and look. I could do that um, to see if, there, if one of the neighborhoods checked is within the city of Kenmore. And I can do that, but I'm not sure it is. It wasn't. Well, they, 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 they just check certain neighborhoods and then extrapolate and expand. No, these are, they, they don't extrapolate. So what one thing people say is whatever your count is, when we say East King County, it's probably higher because it doesn't say, oh, we did Issaquah and Bellevue and, that's a th and, and Woodenville, and that's a third of the area, so we counted 100, so we're going to say it's 250 total. No, it's, this is how many people they counted 
um, as best they could. For like in Issaquah, one challenge in Issaquah is they know they're there, but they're in woods where they can't get access. So this is who they were actually able to identify. Um, and it's no attempt to then interpolate that as to a, a different number. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Smith. Thanks, Arthur, for the, uh, the comments. And, and I have a, <clears throat> you know, this, it's hard for me to um, decipher the data. And you've got lots of good information here. Um, but there's so many things that seem like they, you could make an argument on both sides of clearly there's a problem for affordability. I don't, uh, that's not an argument. It's trying to figure out how much to do for our city relative to what I see in some of the data. And when you look at um, just even some of the, the, the raw data, like our average rents being 20%, 21% lower than other east side cities, mm -hmm. you know, it works, it kind of, right. You know, it's, tr it's hard to try to balance that with, okay, we are, most of our citizens don't work here. And so how does that relate to it? And then also having a higher percentage of lower wage jobs in our city than some of the other surrounding areas. And, and um, I'm having trouble pulling all the data together in my mind to figure out which direction and how our need is specific or different than maybe some of the other cities. That's more okay. of a, I guess, a comment right. than a question. It just, I, I'm yes. not sure exactly what I think of all this yet. Right. And there's a lot of good information here. It's just hard to try to pinpoint a direction to take it. So, so what I, that is a comment, it's, um, is that what, there is a lot of data. And so what we attempted to do here is translate that a little bit to kinds of households because if, if you agree that some of these households seem to ring true that there is a housing need there, then we can, and that's what we'll get to in the next part is when we're doing strategies, we can say, oh, what strategies might help seniors stay in their homes or what strategies can help lower, we'd like strategies to address some of these population needs that we have out there. Um, I think, and one reason we did it is because even though your community is, in some measures, is doing be is, is better off, I think what this data says is there's still a lot of people in, in, in all communities who are challenged with their housing conditions. And so the question for doing this next step was, does this help you give us guidance on, yeah, look at it from this point of view. And that's what we're trying, we're sort of trying to feel out because we feel the same way at times, that the data is overwhelming. Right, and, and then once you, you know, you see this and you say, well, how, how is this in balance relative to even other areas? I know we live in an expensive area of the country, and so it's trying to figure out, we know, let me put it in another way. We know we have a need for sidewalks. We want lots of sidewalks. We don't have enough money to do them all, mm -hmm. but it's it, tr to try to figure out where to put them and, and, and how many miles of sidewalks to create it's very difficult. And so when I look at this, it's um, the acknowledgement of the problem. I don't want to fall down a slippery slope that means that we all of a sudden have to assume it's our problem solely to address. That there, there's, a lot of other, um, there's a lot of other dynamics in play here, and I'm concerned about uh, making sure that we're doing a reasonable job and a good job in ways that we can um, spend our resources, but on the same hand, I don't want us to to be overly, um, feel like we have the obligation to allow everybody to live wherever they want. Right. So on, on that front, I think that we've helped some cities who have, a neighboring city of yours who was challenged um, for their efforts um, formally and legally. and. You've described exactly what is meant to be the setting and the tone if you read the countywide planning policies. There is an acknowledgement that cities are not the sole dictator of what occurs for housing in their community. But if you have needs within reason, are you attempting to address needs within reason as you see them occurring in your community? 
And so it is, and so I think it's not meant to be a slippery slope. It's meant to be with what we have available and the tools, and that's where we're getting to the strategy discussion. What tools do we think are reasonable and that we can manage and address needs? And so this is helping, the idea behind these last three slides is to sort of say, does this help us understand how to focus better? Rather than just saying we need this big number to say, mm -hmm. well, we need things and here are different ways. And if we can find ways within our resource bases and the tools at our disposal as a jurisdiction, then are these the right directions for us to have the commission look at, work with the commission to look at? Okay, great. Thank you. I, I can appreciate that. Councilmember Herbig. <clears throat> so I think this is a this is a really good um, starting point for a conversation. Uh, one thing I did notice, though, is that there um, I didn't see any discussion in there about ways that we could pr protect current low income renters. Um, there are tools out there, and I, I don't know if we have laws on the books about this yet. Uh, but I'd be interested to find out if we have a uh, law in the books uh, protecting um, source of income discrimination, uh, okay. Section Eight. Um, discrimination, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you know the state requires 60 days notice for increases of rent over a certain size, but I know we can go to 60 days, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and I think with the way rents are going right now, um, giving folks an additional month's notice when their rent's going to go up by more than 10% might mm -hmm. make a lot of sense to at least give them more time to find another place that they can afford, uh, even if it's not in Kenmore. A mm -hmm. um, couple other things that I'd like to discuss would be, um, especially when it comes to discussion around our mobile home parks, would be really looking at some relocation assistance uh, above and beyond what's currently um, mandated. I, there are there's some sort of state um, law around that, but I know we can go above and beyond that if we need to. Um, and I, I'd like to hear more about a, looking at a just cause eviction ordinance. I don't know if we have one on the books, but uh, being a little bit more clear with landlords' reasons why they can't evict somebody. Um, again, going a little bit above and beyond what the state has, has on the books already. Um, so I'd just like to discuss okay. that uh, as we go forward. Thank you. Other questions? Pardon? Yeah, so, okay, fine. I've got a number of, of questions, and if I need to stop and let other people go, then I will. Um, I notice there's a little bit of discrepancy, and, and it's not significant on page, between 52 and what you've handed out here in that we're showing a household of two um, at, um, at 30%, um, at uh, 21,000 um, income. And uh, here you got it like at 18. So I'm just kind of curious, 30% median income, is it 18 or is it at 20? Uh, I'm, I'm ahead of myself, never mind. If there's a few dollars, it's, if there's a few dollars it, difference. Is it dollars or thousand? If it's dollars, it might, is it because we're 15 it, it's, it's only a few dollars. It, it, okay. it, no, it's not, it's okay. not 18 to 21. It's 18, 21 something to 21 something. Um, but okay, so. There seems to be a large percentage of cost burdened um, seniors. And I find that very disconcerting because they're on fixed income. A lot of them are only on Social Security. They have no way of upping their income. And the other thing is for a lot of the employees here in town, Yes, we have Bastyr University. Yes, we have a couple of big employers, Safeway, people that pay higher, higher wages because of union contracts or whatever reason. We also have a large percentage of lower paid workers. And I, I'm concerned that we have people that are working that are disproportionately spending more of their income than they should be on housing in our community. And I certainly don't think that we can go out and set rates, rent rates. Uh, and, I, and I'm not looking necessarily to do that. But when I look at some, some of the information that is in here, for instance, on, uh, on page 71, taking a look at, um, or, or, no, that's my, that's, 
Yeah, never mind the page number. The graph, attachment number four, that shows cost burden senior households. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at over 65% of uh, the, the cost burden households are seniors. And, and I find that really distressing because carrying that out and looking at the homeless population nationwide, we have well over 50% of the homeless population as seniors. And then I look at what we've done, and, and Mrs. Bent, maybe you can help me with this one. We recently set the affordable housing at 80% at of median income. Is that correct? Is that what, with across the street, we said 80% is our affordability requirement? 85. 85%. So then when we're talking about the transit-oriented developing that, and we're asking for 10% or 20% or whatever percent we're asking for, that's at what we said at 85%. Is that correct? No. No, the affordability levels in the transit-oriented district are different. Okay, is that throughout town or just in that, in that transit-oriented development area? Just in the TOD-defined area. So if we wanted to then expand that area to a larger percentage of town to the 35% range instead of the 85% range, we're certainly free to do that, right? You can set the affordability levels at um, more uniformly by area. The city. You can set them. You can you can do it in many different ways, but there has to be so some logic and rationale to it. Okay, because I mean, looking at this piece of paper that you handed out. For a family of two, just a husband and wife and seniors, you know, we're, we're expecting um, at the 30% income, uh, 21,600 uh, roughly as income level, and the most they can really afford without being cost burden is $542 a month. That just doesn't, that just doesn't seem right. We have a number of people who have lived in this town for years. And I think that we ought to try, at least in future development, have areas for seniors that are, that are more cost affordable. And whether it's giving incentives or whatever, I think that we really owe it to the seniors to be able to stay in the community and the people that work in the community to be able to live in the community. So if I could comment or sort of pick up Please. on your comment. So Heron Landing is a development that has, well, there's Heron, I get the two mixed up, but one's for family and one's for seniors. Mm -hmm. The right. senior portion has units that are split, that they're affordable at either 40, 50, and 60, or 30 and 50 percent of median income. So that's an example of a building that does, through assistance, that's a direct assistance, and we'll come back when we look at strategies, that did manage to get all the way down to 30 percent of median for seniors and for families using a variety of subsidy tools to get there. So is that an example of what you're yeah, referring to? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And I think that, that we, have, we have said in the TOD we want to offer incentives to get affordability down to help seniors, to help working people. I think that we should just expand that to, to the rest of the community. Um, to where we have the opportunity for multifamily to give them increased um, increased density or something else. And that's something I would seriously like the Planning Commission to look at. Because all throughout this document, you're talking about cost burden seniors and cost burden young adults. Mm -hmm. And maybe they should... And I don't believe this for a minute, but maybe they should look elsewhere to live. But, I, you know, I think they have a right to live close to their job, wherever that job may be. So uh, that I want to make sure that we have housing that is applicable for everybody. And if there's something that we, we can't force it to be built, I know that. But I want to be able to offer the, the incentives, and I'd like the Planning Commission to look at that. Councilmember Sperry. Yeah. Um, do you have more of your presentation, Arthur? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, would it be okay if we? I'd like to see the rest of it okay. and then proceed with the discussion. Okay. Because yeah, because we're overlapping, but um, it probably would be just as well given how you want your conversation. Let your conversation you go. Have something you need now. Um, getting into strategies. Yeah. Did you have a specific question on one of the statistics? Because no. we can go back and forth. I mean, that's we're not. 
so what all the rest of the presentation is basically saying, um, you know, we want to know, the first question is, is this a good way to help us think about the issue? Does this help frame the conversation, doing it the way we've presented the data? But then on strategies, um, I think this is probably helpful to sort of explain because when I've worked with cities, I've always seen that there's sort of three levels of strategies that cities, ha you know, when I, you're, to your question, Councilmember Smith, is what's the slippery slope? And I said, well, it's the tools that you have at your disposal. And this slide here is trying to sort of illustrate the tools that are at cities' disposals to potentially use to address housing needs and with an affordability component. The first is labeled as number A here, and I think this is on page four of, your, um, of the memo we prepared, is to essentially allow a broad diversity of housing within your community. Um, so the work you did do to allow multifamily, et cetera, and basically that allows more capacity for growth. So if you have job growth, you have the ability to match that with housing growth, but also to allow a diversity of housing. This is a country that depends primarily on the private market. And so, but the cities tell the private market what they can or cannot do. And so having your rules written in a way to allow a lot of diversity for the market to respond to needs. And a good example of that is um, in um, Redmond, you are now seeing very small units, micro units. I think they call them eco units, the person who develops them. Very, very small units that are filling up so quickly. Um, and DigiPen students go there, a lot of other people stay in them. But that's, it. but that's just market. The city has no direct assistance, there's no mandatory affordability, it's just the builder is building them because he sees the market. The second category is when you're still primarily working with the private market, but you are directing them. You are saying, we are gonna change the rules for you if you give us something in exchange. And what falls into there is your town center, overlay that you have where you say we'll increase density but we want some affordability for the explicit affordability or we, and we also categorize accessory dwelling units in that category. That we generally in this county say if you build ADUs it's generally affordable to lower moderate income. So that's a good thing and you just automatically get credit. Um, the multifamily property tax exemption which you used across the street again is enough, those are tools where you don't just sort of allow a general, you link it to a benefit in the area of housing affordability. And then the third area is, and, and that can be serving generally from 50 to 80 percent, and you guys are even stretching and getting below that with your density incentive program. Uh, but that's generally where those types of programs fall. Um, and then the final is when you start doing direct assistance, donating land for housing, um, using the arts, you know, using your general funds, which you do through the arts trust fund, um, and that is often leveraging other public fund sources, which is what Heron Landing did and then you have like impact fee waivers. So those are the three basic categories or types. And you can use, and different tools will help different needs. And so we sort of, one of the questions is, should we be looking at all three of these areas of tools or do we focus on one of the three um, kind of thing? So that's one of the basic questions we had. Um, the other is, now I'm going to give you examples in each of those needs areas that we identified of strategies that correlate to the needs. And they may fall in any of these three categories in some cases, but what's also important is some of the strategies will help different needs. Accessory dwelling units can help a first time renter. It might create the cash flow to let a homeowner stay in their home. It can provide an affordable unit. So it might address a variety of different needs. So very quickly, what we did in your, in your memo is we just listed several strategies by the different, and this is not meant to be exhaustive. Um, Commissioner Herbig already mentioned one item that could help lower income workers that isn't on this list right now. But we have you know, land use incentive programs. So as Mayor Baker said, hey, we can help that through our incentive system. You can encourage the mini suites, as I mentioned, or use surplus land. Those are all tools at every one of those levels that might help lower income workers and young households. For seniors, there may be things where you try to do assistance with maintaining homes. So you have the King County Home Repair Program. So it does no interest, you know, low interest or no interest, pay when you sell the home. Uh, again, accessory dwelling units or direct assistance for affordable rental housing. So again, like Heron Landing. For first time buyers, it can be things such as financing programs to help with down payment or to lower interest rates. The Arch Trust Fund has created a down payment assistance program to help first time home buyers. Um, so that's one example of a direct assistance approach. 
um, regulations that might encourage smaller homes or an ADU. I bought my first house and it cash flowed because it had an ADU. That's how I could afford it. Um, or support state legislation. This is an indirect kind of role um, to change. You know, condos are hard to build now because of a lot of the warranty provisions. Are there some tweaks to the state warranty provisions that might make it a little more manageable to build condos? Because in East King County, condominiums is our first time home buyer market. And so that's how we've kind of evolved to that point. And so having that as part of the housing supply can be an area that could help. Um, then in manufactured homes, I think we heard some of the ideas there. Uh, we did, the trust fund did help one group buy, a nonprofit buy from the private owner, the land, because that's what's unique about manufactured housing. It, often the residents, they own their home but not the land. And so you're subject to the whims of the owner. We help the nonprofit buy the land so that you have someone who's not going to change the use in the future. Um, Bothell has an overlay. They have a manufactured housing zoning overlay that in their community. Um, so that sort of protects it from redevelopment for other uses in the future. Um, for the homeless, um, it's about all those direct assistance tools, but it also means having housing with services linked to that. So a lot of the homeless housing we've, su we've funded is also providing services to help those residents get back on their feet or be able to get back into independent living. It can mean short-term assistance. That's another approach with the homeless is help you for four months, you know, to get your feet back on the ground. And, and then other programs where we try to back up landlords that if they help the homeless persons and there's a problem with maintenance, don't worry, we have a fund that will pay you kind of thing. So things that make landlords more receptive to accepting residents who've been homeless. Um, so those are just a range of different examples that we wanted to put out there to see if that also gives you thoughts. When we think about categorizing, this is kind of how we might go about it and then add more to that, but this was meant just to give you a flavor of attaching strategies on that whole wide spectrum to address specific kinds of household needs. So I think, so we just now have questions there for you. Um, um, Councilmember Smith. I've already spoken, so if somebody else wanted to go that I think hasn't Alan spoken, was waiting, but I'm he was fine already with spoken that. Too. Stacy, Councilmember Danuski. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, I like that idea. Um, I like a lot of these ideas. It's hard to pick where to where to focus. Um, you know, trying to figure out what the biggest bang for the buck is going to be to help the most people, um, and I'm not sure what that is. Um, it sounds like more in the in the rental market than the first time home buyer market. Um, probably like the least thing I would put on the list is increasing zoning in single family homes to put more housing in there. But I do like the ADUs or maybe cottage kind of idea. Um, so yeah, it's just it's hard to figure out exactly uh, you know where to where to focus when there's so much information. Gosh, My mind is open. Councilman Smith? Yeah, out of the strategies, I, I, am, I actually prefer A and B, um, definitely over C. Could but you I, go back to what those are, please, uh, the slide that had those? Sure. And I have a question on C, and with regards to the impact fee waiver, um, you know, I actually kind of like that one as far as I don't care for the C category as much, but I like that aspect of it. I realize it's it's still directly money out of our revenue stream, so it's it's basically a cost, but at least it's a cost that's earmarked towards, um, and it, it has less uh, variability because we can, you know, we can, we know what it's going to be based on um, however we set up an impact fee waiver program. Um, I do have a question with regards to the impact fees, and I think you may have answered this last time, uh, but is there, other than waiving fees, is there any way to add anything to a development fee? And I realize that that actually could be argued works against affordable housing, but I am, I would like to know if there's ever, or if you see in any other municipalities where there's a, an additional fee that can be put on for development affordable. of units. For affordable housing? For specifically earmarked for affordable so housing. So you, the, 
State legislation that creates the impact fees explicitly excludes affordable housing. That was an area where members of ARCH were trying to work together. That was one of the ideas is to somehow allow that to be an option for cities. It used to many, many years ago. So it's not allowed through that vehicle. What some cities have done is they have been able to get fees in lieu of when they have a land use incentive. So instead of building the units on site, they have an option or a right to say, I'll give you some funds in exchange. Um, and that's sort of a policy kind of question, which is better money or units distributed throughout the community. But like in Kirkland, they're making even small projects do something. So when they have a partial unit requirement, they're allowing builders to give a partial payment. So when it's linked to an incentive related to housing, then you can do it, but as a regular impact fee like you do for parks and roads, that's not one of the areas allowed under state legislation at this time. Okay, thank you. And, and with regards to the ADU, I definitely like that, but I'm curious. I know we, we already allow permitted ADUs in the city, mm -hmm. and is there anything we can do differently than in our regulations other than to have a process to make them legal and, and safe and functional? Um, just off the top of my head, there's, there's a requirement if you had a standalone ADU, you have to have a certain size lot to be able to have a standalone ADU. That, that's one thing we could take a look at okay. is maybe um, reducing that requirement. Um, if the ADU is in an established home, I, I'm not quite sure what we could do there, but we could so, certainly take a look at that. So I think that when we've looked at the ADUs, you're, you're right, most of the cities allow them. We're seeing varying levels of use in different cities. Um, and I think, I think I brought it up with this group saying if everybody had ADUs at the same rate as Mercer Island, we'd have 2,000 more ADUs in East King County. Um, in other words, for some reason, it's happening there. And we don't know if it's awareness um, or if it's something in the, per you know, there's, there's land use regulations. There's how does the permit process work? Like some cities are starting to say, we want separate meters for your utilities, and that's a killer, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and so it can be your land use regulations might need some adjustment. It could be looking at how you do the permitting and the fees you charge for the permitting, or it could be community awareness. This is a topic we have found a lot of common interest amongst the East King County cities. We did put on our website a ton of information about ADUs for homeowners so they know what it takes to get it done um, because all the members about 10 years ago said help the world find out more about this. Could we take that further? Maybe. If we all work together, do some campaign, some cities relax the rules a little bit so existing ones come in the door. So there's different ideas other than just say what do we allow in the land use regulatory um, per perspective on this issue. Okay, that's great because that's, I think it makes the most sense in <coughs> sort of like Council Member Danuski, I, I don't really want to see a, a huge change in our, um, you know, our established single family neighborhoods, but yet it, it's probably by far the most practical way to increase density and increase affordability in those areas. And so I would say anything we can do to maybe make it a little easier. I see them all the time in my work that I do. They're all over the place. And they make sense from both the renter's perspective and the landlord's perspective. And, and I think that's a, a logical avenue to look at. Councilmember Herbig. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I've got something stuck in my throat. Um, so yeah, I want to agree with Councilmember Smith. I think we really do need to look at ADUs and what we can do to kind of make that an easier um, option for folks because it is a great way for seniors to stay in their house and their housing longer. Um, first time home buyers to afford a place that they can factor in the rent, uh, that sort of thing. Um, I would like to take a closer look though at C because as we saw in the data, that's where our biggest our biggest challenges are with the lower income folks. Um, and I'd love to examine other ways that we could leverage funding or find other funding to direct on a more dedicated basis towards ARCH. Because um, having it kind of be a, <clears throat> excuse me, a budget decision that always seems to come up at the end of our budgeting um, 
is unfortunate, and I think we need to make it a higher priority in our budgeting. Um, so I'd be interested in that. Mm -hmm. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, all the comments that have been made, I think, are good. They're all ways that we could mm -hmm. attack the problem. My, the main thing that I would like to stress is that we time this in such a way that our stimulation of more affordable housing is timed with the need for more affordable housing. In other words, for example, with the mobile mobile housing units, the trailer parks, if and when those geographic areas are programmed to be redeveloped to multifamily housing, all those people that are being displaced now need a place to live. If we, if, if say there's, say, say on a given plot of land there are 100 mobile homes and 100 then families, then all of a sudden they're displaced at the same time. Can we, if we build ahead of time 100 affordable units, then the likelihood of those 100 affordable units filling up with people from outside of Kenmore, and you still are missing 500 affordable units. Is there a way that you can make it concurrent so that the needs are, 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 are filled by people who have the needs here in Kenmore? Uh, I, just, I just question the ability to, to to time this so that you you have the affordable housing available for the people that are being displaced when they need it. And I don't know whether there's a way to, to do that. If you don't, then you're going to increase the number of people below the average median income in the city. You're going to attract. If you build 100 units, affordable units, and you don't have 10 more residents that want to move into them right away, they're going to fill up with people from outside the city and you wind up with more people that are at that income level. And is that the goal that we have, or is the goal to satisfy the needs of the seniors that want to get out of their homes into something smaller, or the young adults who are, are not earning an income that allows them to get into uh, more expensive housing units? So I don't know whether there's a way to do that. But I can see if you don't do that, you may have a problem. Build lots of affordable housing, and then when the people that are being displaced need it, it isn't there. It's already rented. Councilmember Sperry. Thank you. When I was thinking about this, I, I, I had a hard time kind of going to what's our piece in this because of the context of the uh, the region that we live in and how much growth there is in the area for people coming in from all over the world for new jobs and the pressure that that's put on our housing supply and what so a lot of the the, the recent spikes in in um, particularly in purchase housing purchases are because uh, simple supply and demand. Um, for example, uh, average house split level, my neighbor relocated out of the area. It was sold, it was a bidding war in three days. And so, you know, part of that, we, you know, we can't make that all better. But one thing I do think that we can do is continue to have land use policies that do support a diversity of new options, obviously the multifamily and the density and some of the ideas that have already been mentioned here. The other thing that I was reminded of was it was a study that came out in 2008 and it was uh, the UW study that um, a researcher came up with the figure that at that time land use regulations and policies, particularly like the Growth Management Act where so much of the land, buildable land is, is um, taken out of the mix, was adding $200,000 per house based on just on regulations. So all that to say, I think whatever we can do to reduce the barriers to having a diverse type of um, housing, which I agree with the ADUs and, you know, all the different ways and stuff. I think that's what's going to really help us to, um, you know, be, be 
I guess I'll say relatively affordable to us. So that that's one thing. The other thing is I, I really appreciated the focused area about you know recognizing that people are in different seasons of life and that the issues are different uh, at different ages. And it just as a personal story, I was reflecting on when I was a single parent and I had two small children and working two jobs. And so you know everybody has their own individual affordability housing strategy and mine was to rent a basement apartment. I basically rented an ADU. And so I, I just appreciate that, you know, whatever we can do that makes it easier to build these kinds of um, affordable units, I think is a good thing. Um, the, the one thing, too, that um, I think is really important for part of what drove, at least in my mind, this issue um, to be more focused on this year is we are a community in transition, and we are seeing a lot of new development. And I think that I can't, you know, I probably hear half a dozen times, you know, what's going to happen to the people in the mobile home parks? Um, because, you know, the land will likely be re redeveloped. And I would like to have an answer for that um, before that happens. And so what I was hoping to see is not only some strategies to um, help you know, with relocation, but also what what is available to um, to someone that was going to have to go through that. Uh, and I do appreciate what you were saying about uh, the options. Particularly, I know there's the senior uh, mobile homes along the river. Uh, those would be interesting to see what um, what options are if, in terms of if, you know the land preserving those and things. So I guess then the strategies that, that I really feel that we ought to be looking at are to make sure that we have housing available or we, we can't direct any type of housing to be built anywhere. But we can do incentives and encouragement to make sure that we have housing supply that's available down to the 30% median income. That's one thing I certainly hope we would, we would look at and study. I know we're never going to meet the needs of everybody, but I would like to make sure that the opportunity is there and the incentives are there for us to try to achieve that goal. <coughs> Councilmember Curtis. I had a couple thoughts. One is on the ADUs, that it's easy to say you'll allow an ADU, but if the person doing that has to obey all the development rules, like if it was two, prop, two houses, it be, can become cost prohibitive. So for instance, I'm, I've looked at it kind of for our property, and again, the idea of I'd like to stay there next to my garden forever, um, but I'm not sure I can afford the house forever without renting part of it out because who needs a house that big with two people? But if I had to put in a road wide enough to get a fire truck up it, a tenth of a mile with sidewalks, um, a new bridge over the stream, and all the other things, I could not afford to do an ADU. So somehow that's, that's the obstruction to ADUs is applying all the rules, the development rules that, that we have. Um, so that would be one thing I think we need to address if, if this is going to be a real discussion at all. Okay. Then the second thing, I, I generally favor um, incentives that benefit um, the low-income people who need the help, the city, and, and I believe um, giving people a place to live is a city benefit. And then also one that, that benefits developers. So I prefer to not shift the cost from the city and say, well, we'll just load all those costs on the developers because they're rich anyway. I, I, I like to see things where everybody gets some benefit. So I tend to favor um, the apartments, high density, where the developers, yes, they're giving more of their um, rental units up for the more affordable levels, but we let them get enough extra units that it all pencils out for them. So they've helped citizens, They've helped the city, 
and we haven't penalized them by allowing that. So those are the, the ideas I have, the ADUs and then the, the high density apartments. Anybody else? Councilmember Smith. Yeah, I about the, <clears throat> if you seek something as low as like a 30% um, threshold for on, based on adjusted medium income, is that something that in your experience you see as possible through incentives or is that something that really gets into the requiring direct assistance? Because it's such a financial burden that somebody has to bear, whether it's the city or the property owner. And I'm just wondering what you, how you see that in your experience. So I have two answers. One is that generally for the reason you stated, it is hard for that B category to get that low. Um, and we have seen, in fact, in your needs assessment, you'll see We've done charts to show how affordable housing has been created in every city for the last 20 years. And when you look at the market, <coughs> it's helped some at the moderate income level. The category B has helped <coughs> more in the moderate, a little bit in the low. And then the direct assistance is usually what you need to get all the way down. Now, sometimes we've used those incentives so that we don't need as much subsidy and so we can still get down so they can still partner. But you also have taken a very unique approach in your town center that I'm um, fascinated to see how, where you did such a big density increase that what you did, instead of saying we want, and this was, Councilmember Curtis was part of this conversation many years ago, that rather than just asking for a higher and higher percentage of affordable units, we'll get to a 10% level and we'll keep making units more affordable. And so you have one where you are trying to get all the way down to 30% if somebody uses your full bonus. Because, but what we're doing is the way that formula is working is we're giving a lot more units for every one of those affordable units that are at 30 than the ones that are going to be at the 70% level. So the math is hopefully working out right. So you actually had a situation where your density increase is great enough that we might achieve that or that you're trying to achieve that. But your numbers are hopefully just as sound as the cities who are at a different level. It's just we took advantage of the amount of increase, and instead of making it broader, we f you focused it more. Thank you. Anybody else? Councilmember Sperry. Thank you. Uh, one policy consideration that I do believe is important is that we need to think about the property tax implications uh, of some of these um, ideas and be careful that what we do to try to create a unit of affordable housing doesn't help to make it less affordable for people to stay in their homes because of okay. higher property taxes. So, so for ownership units, just as an yes. FYI since you raised the point, is we have, whenever we use land use incentives to create ownership units, um, we have a covenant Mm -hmm. And because of that covenant, the assessor assesses the homes based on the affordable price, and then we base our pricing accounts for the property taxes that the homeowner has to pay. So basically, they, there's not a reduction in the, pro the property tax, is what you're saying? It's sort of subsidized? Is that what I'm hearing it's you not, say? It's that the assessor says, since you can only sell that home for, let's say, 250000 and maybe it's worth three hundred mm -hmm. on the open market, because you can only sell that, your benefit as a homeowner is only at 250000 mm -hmm. They will pay property taxes based on it being $250,000 home. Yeah. And then when we calculate the pricing that's affordable, we're accounting for the property taxes within the overall housing costs. Right. And so I wasn't necessarily thinking about new units in terms of keeping those affordable. I'm talking about people who are seniors trying to stay in their homes. Okay and pay the property taxes. So there are several programs for seniors depending on your income level where you either get to defer or even potentially waived. Mm -hmm. And it, it, there's a couple different programs, but be happy to sort of call that out a little bit more when we're working on the strategy plan. Yes, I know that we did receive an email saying that the, actually the number of, of seniors taking advantage of that to me was surprisingly low. Exactly. And that seemed like exactly. a gap that, that mm -hmm. was not really right. well known. Thank you. I saw I was surprised at that article too. 
All right, anything else? Do you have other okay. things for us or? So I just, we had several questions, so um, which you've been addressing, but I just wanted, I think what we were looking for tonight, and maybe I should turn it back over to Lori and Debbie is, are we on the right track? Is this a good way to sort of, and with your comments and the things we illustrated, are we on the right track for your commission to have a conversation? Are we on the right track? That's a question. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of head nodding in general. Okay. Okay. So and sample strategies. I think everybody was pretty much in agreement with those sample strategies. There was nobody that was dead and, set against any one of them. And was everyone open to the different ideas that you put out tonight for us looking at those? Mm -hmm. Councilmember Curtis? I would just comment that I'm a little more in favor of the A, B strategies and not so much the C. Some of the C sounded interesting, but I guess I don't want to have kind of a Robin Hood idea where we'll just steal the money from somewhere and give it to somebody else. If we can get a win-win situation where it kind of makes sense and we can, um, can make work, I'm happy to do C. But unless we could do, I know with ARCH funding we can work with other cities and we're, we're basically taking money from some set of citizens and, and giving it for this cause. So I understand there is some of that that's going to happen, but I'm a little more favor of the A and B. All right. Um, specific strategies? Anybody really believes are, are particularly uh, appropriate? Or you want the Planning Commission to sort of <coughs> mull it over? Okay. Any other strategies that we haven't been presented that you guys are wanting? Hmm? Yeah. Yep. You know, one of the things that I remember it had come up before, and I don't, I think the options are pretty limited, but um, a lot of these address, well, let me back up. What none of these really address, though, are funding for like a program like ARCH. They address the need in the community for the housing, but um, obviously I think we all recognize there's some value to having ARCH involved. And, and at one time it was discussed about there being some, tor some type of potential revenue source that we could use on a consistent basis. And that would be the only other thing I would maybe add. If there's something, and I don't want this to be a big onerous bureaucracy that we're creating, but I do think it would be reasonable since we do budget every year a certain amount for ARCH, if we could have some kind of a committed um, revenue source that we could rely on and it would help us in our budgeting process and it would take a little bit of the, the um, you know, the emotion out of it because it's more procedural. And I think that's something we should look at as a council when we start discussing the budget rather than turning it over to the Planning Commission. So I think that's something that we as a council okay. should, should really be aware of, and I think that's a very good point. So, <coughs> so along, is having a placeholder, though, for that topic, is that For us? Yes. For us, yes. Yes, for the council, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I think we, we all talked about different things here, and as long as, you know, you, you, you look at what we discussed and talked about, that would be good. Okay. And is there anything that you heard tonight that we should not be emphasized, that we should not be concerning ourselves with looking at? You don't see anybody saying that there so anything should not be looked at. So does that help? Oh, Councilmember Curtis? I don't remember what they're called, but those little teeny houses on wheels, I don't like those. Oh, okay. tiny houses. <laughs> Trailers. <laughs> yeah, trailers. RVs. Campers. RVs are okay. Campers. But when RV. they become oh, houses, oh, that's RVs not okay. RVs are okay. Yeah, people can drive around and go camping in RVs. But. Well, you can pull a tiny house, too. <laughs> a lot of people live in them in Seattle. Mm -hmm. I think we already gave direction earlier yeah. in, in the year, so we know that's kind of off the table okay. for now. Um, well, that's only one of us, though. There's another one that really wants tiny houses, so... But as, as a whole, Council, when we were looking at um, micro-housing, you said to not 
take it to that next level of looking at tiny houses when we had the discussion on micro housing. So it sounds like you're in general agreement in how the need was um, classified tonight. Um, that you know you all have sort of different interests here, but there was no sort of direct no to, to, on any particular topic. And the one last question is: um, staff is recommending that the focus is on affordable housing and that we don't pick up some of these other issues. So I just want to make sure that there's a you're okay with with that approach. Affordable housing. Okay. To what level? To what level? What percent? Thirty percent. I, I've heard that a couple of people are interested in looking at how to um, provide incentives for 30 percent. Yes, I've heard that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is um, authorize city manager to negotiate and execute contracts for financial software system purchase, implementation, and maintenance. Mrs. Gregory. Ms. Gregory. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I had been pretty eagerly anticipating this conversation tonight until about an hour and a half ago when we had those technology issues, and I sincerely apologize for that. Um, I'd kind of like to know if you've um, gotten the internet connectivity. It came back and then left again. I didn't, yeah, I didn't, didn't. It came back and so then left again. I can't see again. what you're talking about. You can just read it to us, okay? I just to Oh, good idea. Good idea. Well, I guess what we're going to have to do is uh, figure out a way to beef up the signal in here. Yeah. Because uh, I think the staff it's, was having some issues, too. Yeah, I mean, it's, oh. it's, it's been bad for a long time. But this is the first time it's really been. I think it's out. Here's the, here's the problem when we have so many computers tying into it at the same time. No. It's that the access points. I mean, you can get... The council stuff weekly back there, a little stronger here. You can't get it back in Rob's office. You can't get the public one back in the back office, but you can get it out here and you can't get it somewhere else. It's just not not strong enough anywhere. Well, we'll definitely look into that. I apologize. So here we are tonight after five and a half months since the RFP for financial software. Uh, leading up to tonight. I hope I can persuade you that it's time for the city to implement a more uh, sophisticated and newer financial management system. My recommendation and that of my six-member team is a product known as Tyler Encode. Uh, this is a system based on Microsoft technology that provides an intuitive user experience, seamless and secure applications that work together, and vast data management capabilities. ENCODE specifically is used by more than 2,200 clients, 90% of which are cities. It provides over 50 modules that share information working together to eliminate duplicate entry, and it is designed and supported entirely in-house and specifically for local government. Although um, most of the modules that they provide aren't needed for the city, such as municipal court, utility billing, tax management, licensing. It serves to illustrate that they have a really um, comprehensive depth, depth of service to the public sector. So the recommendation for Kenmore is that we acquire general ledger and budgeting capability, accounts payable, project accounting, procurement, miscellaneous billing, fixed assets, cash sharing, and human resources, which includes payroll. The ENCODE product has been introduced to new clients with over 20 years of software conversions and implementations, and they're staffed by MBAs and CPAs, network technicians, and certified developers. All future enhancements to this software are provided through a perpetual license commitment at no additional cost beyond the annual maintenance fee, assuring that Kenmore will always have industry-leading technology. This is a switch from how software was provided in past decades where every time there was a, a new release, you had to pay a pretty exorbitant fee to, to get on board with that. 
That's not the way of the industry now. The parent company, Tyler Technology, has more than 14,000 clients in the U.S., Canada, U.K., and other locations. They offer and support various tiers of financial software systems. Um, those are known as Eden and Munis and Microsoft Dynamics, used by many of our neighbors, such as Bothell, Mount Lake Terrace, Maple Valley, <clears throat> Woodenville, and Edmonds. But 100% of their focus is the public sector, unlike the fundware product we use today, which has always really been focused on the nonprofit industry. The company has received many years of recognition as a top software and service provider and has been named eight times as a Forbes list of best small companies in America based on their earnings and sales growth as well as stock performance. It's a financially solid company. The customer support offered by Tyler was a very important consideration. There are several layers of support offered to every client, including on-site and group training during implementation and preparation to, to go live with the system. There are community blogs, regional user groups, remote training, live toll-free support, an online training center with a number of teaching webinars and documents that can be accessed from their website. The implications of efficiencies for our staff are tremendous. Employees will be able to access an online system and enter their time every day with activity codes identifying what programs or projects they're working on. Supervisors can, will review and approve online, and payroll be, will be able to upload their time records by pressing a key, not manually re-entering every hour recorded by every employee from paper copies. There'll be no more printed papers, uh, direct deposit stubs, because every employee will know when new pay data, data is available and can review the details online. Engineering won't have to create all those many off-the-book spreadsheets to keep up with their revenue and expenditure status on capital projects because they will be able to track and query current data for their project at any time. Budget entry will be done right in the software so that once approved, a keystroke will post it to all the accounts. And everyone will be able to view and drill down to the details of their expenditure budgets and line items without waiting for finance to run a special report. Even that monthly financial statement that is prepared for your consideration every month is, is manually created by re-entering data that we have to get off of printouts from our fundware system. So in summary, this means less paper, on-demand financial and budgetary information and better use of staff time. And you know, many of these um, new and exciting prospects for us aren't really that new or innovative. They've actually been available and utilized by other companies, public and private, for years. We just haven't had any of those capabilities in our current system. So I recognize that this is a considerable expenditure. However, the efficiencies across the organization are, are priceless. Um, with the city's positive 2015 revenue outcome, I feel we can justify a one-time expenditure request of up to $155,000 from the general fund. This request does have built-in contingencies and opportunities for some savings when we actually negotiate the terms of the license and the implementation contract. There's no annual maintenance fee due for the first year, and that will, will not occur until the next biennium in the amount of about 15000 I provided additional information about the Tyler ENCODE product in the agenda bill, and I, I hope you were able to take a look at it and access it. Um, and I thank you for considering this request, and I will now be happy to answer questions. Questions? Hearing and seeing none, uh, Chair will entertain a motion to uh, authorize had, the city manager. I had one quick question. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, where is this company based? Is it? Texas. Out of Texas, okay. So the Chair will entertain a motion to oh. authorize the city manager to uh, negotiate and execute contract for financial software system purchase implementation and maintenance with Tyler Technologies for uh, ENCODE Enterprise Resource Solution. Uh, in an amount not to exceed $170,000. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Councilmember Sperry. 
Well, first of all, this is long overdue. I expected this ask earlier, <laughs> but you, when I read the memo, you had me at one of the, the people that you queried said that they even loved it. If they love new software, it must be good. <laughs> Thank you very much. You, you seldom hear that. No, it's very unusual. <laughs> and uh, frankly, um, I wanted you to make sure that you got your money's worth out of the last system that we bought 11 years ago, yep. even though I've... You did. Been unhappy with it for many years. <laughs> um, so I just have one question. You indicated yeah. that employees can, can enter the time when they're working on different projects. Yes. Do we have an effective way for the amount of time to be, that has been spent on individual public records requests? Yes. So we do have that. We have um, all of the time. We're, spent. we're trying Perfect. to... No. to fumble our way through that now with our manual timekeeping yeah. system. But it'll make it and easier yes. to do this. With this, this way will it'll be very easy to do and you can pull a report instantaneously. Boy, you got me on hooked that. Now. All right. And even like uh, in, in law firms and accounting firms when you track billable hours, yeah. we can track uh, time on the phone and email spent with certain clients. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. And probably certain council members. <laughs> Because I'm guilty of that one. Um, all right. Any uh, any further questions? Clerk, please take the roll. Deputy Mayor Van Ness? Yes. yes. Council Member Sperry? Yes. Council Member Herbig? Yes. Mayor Baker? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Danuski? Yes. Council Member Curtis? Yes. 7-0. Thank you. Now. Thank you so much. Next item on the agenda, according to what's written on the agenda, is the chicken ordinance. Can I do something fun first? Did we uh, modify the agenda? Yes, go ahead. I know, exactly. What's more fun than the chicken ordinance? So the yep. uh, interpretive sign for the Jack Rockwood State Park has arrived, and so this is the sign for the park. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, this is just a really neat trigger for Jack Crossover. Yep. Okay, chicken ordinance. Brian. <laughs> <laughs> So you're chicken to present it, right? <laughs> so what happened is there's a citizen asking that uh, we increase the number of chickens per single family from, I think, three to six. And I asked Brian how easy that is, and he said it would be pretty easy. But, you know, is, are things like this really ever easy? Because then you get into, are these chickens or are they roosters? And should we allow roosters? And if so, how many? And what about if they have a bunch of cats and dogs to go on top of that? And, and what about other animals? What about bunnies? And, and so it can blossom into a larger discussion. So my question to you is, before Brian gives a quick summary, is do you want us to try to squeeze it in this year? Or you just want to wait till the January re retreat and decide whether you want to put it on your docket in 2017? So, Brian, can you give a quick explanation Back, of what we uh, have now? I think Rob forgot to mention that. I, we don't. Yeah, we don't need to deal with it now. General consensus, but we can go on the retreat. But if he's already prepared it, let's hear it. Um, I forget. I think Rob forgot to mention that. I, th I think I was the third or fourth person he asked to do this, and um, <laughs> I, don't know, I got to try, I do this short straw or something like that. <laughs> But um, the uh, the citizen, I think she was a citizen of Kenmore, had the question about if we can increase the amount of chickens in Kenmore and gave a couple examples of a nearby city. So I pulled up some um, regulations from next door at Bothell, and I could explain to you what our code says, and then I could tell you what Bothell says, and, and you guys can do what you want with that information. So our code says that small animals, including chickens, roosters, and cats and dogs, um, not kept indoors as household pets shall be limited as follows. You get three per household on lots of 20,000 square feet or less. So three dogs, one dog, two chickens, three chickens total, three roosters. 
you could have three roosters in Kenmore on a small lot. Um, it goes up to five per household on lots between 20 and 35,000 square feet. And then it goes up an, an additional two animals per acre on sites over 35,000 square feet, up to a maximum of 20, 20 roosters. I keep coming back to roosters because that's uh, interesting. Okay, so similarly, next door in Bothell, on chickens that are, chickens are prohibited on properties less than 5,000 square feet. Um, up to five total chickens are allowed on properties 5,000 to 7,000 square feet. And up to eight total adult chickens on properties 7,200 to 35,000 square feet. And so if you take into consideration our most dense zoning, R6 is six dwellings per acre, it's about a 7,200 um, square foot lot size. And so in Bothell, on a 7,200 square foot lot size, they could have eight chickens. But here, you can have three. But they can't have roosters in Bothell. In most other cities, you can't have Bothell, or roosters. Just one big band of roosters. Can you explain the birds and the bees a little bit with that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how necessary is a, so is a rooster not necessary at any level to raise successful chickens? Do you have to come to Kenmore? To get your, you have to come to Kenmore in order to to have a rooster. Yeah, and for the the chickens have to come to Kenmore in order to you know. <laughs> to, uh, to <laughs> you can wing oh. it. <laughs> are you are you ready for questions? Because I've got a couple of people ahead. Sure. Yeah. Councilmember Herbig. So Brian, I could have sworn a couple of years ago that roosters were banned in the city of Kenmore. I mean, I could have sworn I was sitting in the back and this discussion was. I think it was a discussion, but I don't know how much traction it gained, and I don't think that it got codified into the code. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, I'm completely in favor of banning roosters. There's no need for that around here. There's absolutely no need for that. And I honestly don't care how many chickens anybody has, but roosters we absolutely do not need. Yeah, yeah. Stage of digital alarm clocks. Yeah, yeah I. I yeah, I don't know if I agree with that necessarily, but. So do you guys want to wait till January to discuss this at the retreat? I think so. Yeah. Nope. Customer swear you look like you. Yeah, well, I, I guess I was, usually the, the obviously the, the neighborhood impact is the rooster. I mean, that's the thing. And I actually did think that we also had where it was just the the hens. I didn't realize that we allowed roosters, so um, I guess it's probably a little optimistic to think we could just simply say no to roosters and have more chickens. So I guess I will concur. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> Sounds like we will uh, to be continued on this one. Yeah, there's a number of properties with acreage that have chickens and roosters. All right, so um, retreat. Retreat. All right, thanks. In January. In, in January. In January. Mm -hmm. Not the budget retreat. All right. Um, city manager, comments? Uh, that's it. Thanks, Brian. I owe you one. Um, comments, reports. Council Member um, Smith. I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Council Member Sperry. Nothing at this time. Council Member Curtis. Nothing to add. Council Member Herbig. Just looking forward to figuring out how the surface works. Council Member Danuski. Nothing to add. Council Member, uh, Deputy Mayor Van Ness. If we have three chicken in a hen house and the fox gets in and eats one chicken, can the fox stay? <laughs> and, and if he eats two more chickens, you can replenish the stock. Yeah. You didn't say anything about foxes. Yeah. Is that the plural of fox? I don't know. Feeks. Nothing else. Um, 
So I w was privileged because of my being vice president of Sound Cities Association. I got to go on a uh, inner city study mission with the uh, Seattle uh, Chamber. And I had some good conversations with the chief of staff deputy mayor in, uh, of Seattle and uh, a number of other uh, community leaders, including Google people um, and some other uh, prominent employers in the region and uh, doing my sales pitch on Kenmore. So it, we'll see what happens anyway. Um, I think that's it. We are now going to adjourn to executive session. How long? 45 minutes? And no action? Action may be taken. Thank you. No? Okay. Action, no action will be taken, but it's first one to, to RCW 42.30.1101, subsection I, potential litigation. Yes. That's a transportation benefit district board meeting that is totally separate. Yes, we are coming back for that. But it has nothing to do with the council meeting. Huh? Um, I'm not the chair of that one. But you might have to talk with Joanne and, and Alan. Like, and is it legally even? Do you think 45 minutes too long? So to get myself on speaker, is it legally even an option to consider postponing that for another week? Uh, we haven't discussed that as part of the agenda yet, so I don't know. Your Honor, um, the city attorney is recommending 30 minutes instead of 45. Okay, so we will be in executive session for 30 minutes. No action is, is anticipated. All right, and so then we can, uh, I guess there's some talk here, but I guess we're still in the council meeting, so transportation benefit district is not necessarily warranted in the council meeting. But there's talk of postponing it. Mm -hmm. Joanne, do we have to have a meeting every six months? We haven't had it for a year. We had one last October. Did we? Last October. Fine. It's not much, is it? No, it's not much. It's just approving the financials. Yeah. Okay, fine. We'll do it. Fine. Okay. Uh, so we're going to adjourn into executive session 30 minutes. No action is anticipated. Alan, you know, it's much better if you go through the pages sideways one at a time instead of scrolling and get to things quicker. Yeah, because you can go to individual page members. I know. But, Alan, I would.